You know, I have a real hard time getting my foot up there, but somehow it ends up in my mouth sometimes without unexpecting it. And, and what I've noticed is that sometimes that happens when I'm nervous. Or, here's the worst one, when I'm trying to be funny. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of the reasons why I don't tell jokes because you know you, you got to have that rhythm you know you got to have the meter you, you got to be able to just kind of put it together or you've got to have that weird kind of voice to go with it to make it sound funny you, like New Yorkers can when they put their accent on something and it just sounds funny because the way you say it or you got to be Yogi Berra and it just has to be such nonsense it's funny right you all don't know Yogi Berra <laughs> Okay, Google Yogi Berra for some Yogi Berraisms, right? Some, some, some crazy stuff that, that he says. Uh, I was up, up at Thousand Pines for uh, our family camp. This is about 20-some years ago, maybe a little, probably a little more than that if I was counting right here. And uh, we were up there for a family camp. We had a gentleman up there named Merlin Carruthers. Merlin Carruthers taught about praise. And so f we were there for the weekend. Well, I was the pastor selected to come back down the mountain and preach the three morning services while the family camp stayed up here at Thousand Pines. So I got down here and I was in the second service and I was asking people about what are they praising God for or something like that. And I used an illustration that related to the camp and then I said, oh, you guys haven't heard that yet so you don't know what I'm expecting of you. Somebody in the front row got offended by that. In fact, the rest of the sermon as I preached about praise, this person thought I was looking right at them. Now, I do that to Paul, but no... <laughs> But the person was so upset that I got an anonymous letter like this long that week about how cruel and mean I was to look at this person during the message and to speak exactly at them. And I was trying to hit them because they hadn't been praising God that day. And I got this letter and I had no idea who it was. Some years later, I had a lady in my office and she had her little daughter there. And we were talking about this little girl and whether this girl could be baptized or not. And I said, well, let's ask her. And so I said, Tirza, who's Jesus? Jesus is God's son. He died on the cross for me. And I want him to live in my life. And I turned back to mom and I said, why wouldn't we baptize her? And she starts to cry. She says, my, when my son was eight years old, they said he, he, we couldn't baptize him. He needed to be older. I guess it was five. He needed to be older. And, 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 they, and now he's like 14 and he doesn't want to be baptized. And then, she, and then she says, do you remember getting an anonymous letter? <laughs> writing that letter oh my goodness you're the one who, I said I didn't even know you then <laughs> we can say and some embarrassing things right without even realizing it without even think about it <laughs> some political comments that were made some years ago uh, in this would be quite a few years ago. You'll recognize the names. Give Bill a second term and Al Gore and I will be turned loose to do what we really want to do. Hillary Clinton speaking at a 1996 Democratic fundraiser. <laughs> and we'll be turned loose to do what we want to do. Or here, here's this one. George Bush said, it will take time to restore chaos and order. <laughs> there were a whole bunch of them by George and I'm not going to pick on him. But <laughs> Al Gore said, a zebra can't change its spots. <laughs> and then Barry Toive, who was the White House spokesman, says, it's not easy getting up here and saying nothing. It takes a lot of preparation. <laughs> okay. I'm not sure if I should say these or not. Go for it. Okay. It, Joan, if I offend you, you just have to, you know... Okay, just really, okay. <laughs> okay, so have you ever noticed that, that people get really nervous at funerals? Uh, let's just face it. People say some dumb things. 
okay, really dumb things. And, and, and a lot of it is because you know, they don't know what to say. Sometimes the pastors don't either. The priest, during a service for someone who had died of a drug over, overdose, he died doing what he loved. Ouch. Okay. Young lady said, my grandmother was cremated and we were having a service to pay our respects. I was scared and I didn't want to go up alone, so my dad went with me. We stood there side by side, stared in reverent silence at the small, simple wooden box holding my grandmother's ashes. After a minute or so passed, my father bowed slightly, leaning in with what I assumed would be words of wisdom, and said, your grandmother was a lot smaller than I remember. <laughs> I had to fight just not to burst out laughing in a room full of mourners. <laughs> I had a whole list that I thought I would warn you with of things not to say at a funeral. Um, and I would just tell you, don't tell... Please, and I know a lot of us think we do, please don't say to somebody, I understand how you feel. Or, you know, they're in a much better place right now. And there's all kinds of other advice that we give. In fact, it's not the time to give the advice. <coughs> I'll say this at the end of the message, and I'll say it here at the beginning as well. Sometimes the best thing you can say is nothing. In fact, the most important thing might be said, not by your words, but by simply by your hug or the tear on your cheek. Or if you're going to share anything at all, share of a memory that you have that was special about the person. But also don't ask, now what can I do for you to help you? You realize how many things and how troubled the people are that are going through grief? They just need people to do things for them. You know what? If you take them food and they don't like it, they can throw it away after you leave. Okay? But do things for them. I think one of the best stories I remember was the man who, who was the neighbor and he didn't know what to say. He went over to the house and because mother of four children had died. And, and he's like, what do you say? What do you say to these kids? What do you say to the dad who's lost his bride and now has four children to raise? And so what he did is he went into the house and he found their shoes and he shined... <coughs> Now, you wouldn't do this with sneakers, obviously, okay? But he found all their shoes and he shined all their shoes so that they'd be shined for the, for the services. He spoke with his action. He looked for a need. He didn't ask, do your shoes need shined? <laughs> he just went in and started doing something. When people are hurting, people are grieving, what we say with our words is oftentimes the least we can do. And what we really need to do is simply be silent and listen. We're going to come to a dramatic moment today. Jesus has been, had some, uh, wow, incredible, incredible things have taken place. And he is, in fact, we're in the middle of the gospel of Mark, right at the core, at the heart of what the gospel is all about. All the Gospels have been written so that we can know who Jesus is, that he is the Son of God, that he is the Messiah, to present the Word, the living Word of God to us so we can get to know him. Every single one of them is a living witness, a testimony of who Jesus is. In the Gospel of Mark, at the core of that, Jesus has asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? Peter responds with the most profound recognition that's come to him totally by the inspiration of God himself. They all say, well, you, some say Elijah, some say Moses, some say you're John the Baptist, and some say you're some prophet. And then he asks the question, and this is the question, again, that it's a question every one of us has to face. Who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? And Peter responds, thou art the Christ, son of the living God. Jesus looks at him and says, Peter, 
God's revealed that to you. It's only come because of God speaking through, through you, Peter. You've recognized it because it was what he's revealed to you. You're the Christ, son of the living God. You are the anointed one. You are the Messiah. Peter gets it. And, and the rest of the disciples say, yeah, 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 we get it too. Yeah, yeah, you're the Messiah. And so Jesus says, okay, well, let me explain to you what the Messiah has to do. He says the Messiah has to die. The Messiah is going to be rejected by the chief priests and the elders, by the religious people in the land. He's going to be turned aside by them. And he's going to be killed. And in three days, he's going to rise again. Now, they got focused on the death part of it, the rejection part of it. They didn't even hear the part of it rise again. That is, that's not understandable anyways. They haven't seen somebody, except, and they haven't even had Lazarus be raised yet, okay? So it's still not comprehensible to them. But, but they get the dead thing, and Peter says, hold on. And Peter does that really wonderful thing that we should all do if we're going to correct somebody. Instead of correcting them in public, right? Peter takes Jesus aside. Come here, Master. We need to have a conversation. I need to set some things straight for you, Jesus. You have it wrong. Then the word says that Jesus, Peter actually rebukes Jesus. Whoa! None of us would tell God what to do. We know that. But Peter, Peter you know, Jesus, no, you're not going to Jerusalem. We're not going to let that happen. That's not the way. You know, the Messiah doesn't die. The Messiah is not going to be rejected. So knock off this talk, Jesus. Now, Jesus does what we would rather not happen. Because Jesus says, here, boy. <laughs> Gentlemen, get behind me, Satan. Whoa. And he rebukes Peter in front of them all. Ouch. But what he's really doing is not merely rebuking Peter. Who's he really rebuking? He's saying, Satan, get away. I am tempted not to go to that cross. He will pray in the Garden of Gethsemane. God, please. Dad, Dad, if there's any other way that I can get, get through this, that we can save humanity, if there's any other way that we can give them life, please, God, let's go that way. And he's, he's anguishing, and he's struggling with it. He says, but no, I know that the only way for salvation, the only way to save the world, the only way to bring forgiveness is for me to die and pay the price for them. So your will be done, Father, and I will go to the cross. Jesus was a man tempted in every way, just like you and I. And Jesus was telling Peter, and he's really literally saying, Peter, you're listening to the things of evil because Satan doesn't want me to go to that cross. Satan wants me to take some easy way out. Satan wants me to avoid the difficulty, to avoid the pain, to avoid the rejection. Just like the world doesn't want to accept the fact that I am the way, the truth, the life, and no one comes to the Father but through me. Satan wants to just try to push that aside. And, I, and Peter... As tempting as that is, I can't go that way. I must go to the cross. <coughs> we pick up the story then this week in that Mark chapter 9. <clears throat> and he said to them, I tell you the truth. Some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God come with power. Now, there is a lot of controversy over that one little verse. <laughs> there are people who say, well, well, Jesus was obviously talking about his second coming, and so, but they all died before he returned. So, see, the Bible's not true, and then they throw it away. Oh, wait, that's not what Jesus was saying. <laughs> Some here are not going to taste death before they see the kingdom of God come with power. And they did. In fact, all of the disciples, except for Judas, saw him in power, risen from the dead. Every single one of them saw it. And in fact, there's something even more special. Three of them are about to have an incredible experience with God. Let's go on. After six days, Jesus took Peter James and John with him and led them up a high mountain where they were all alone. 
Let's pause again for a moment. If you remember our map of Israel, if you can picture the Sea of Galilee up here in the northern part of Israel, and Capernaum is up on the northeastern shore. Jesus fed the 4,000 over here on, excuse me, on the northwestern shore. Jesus said the, fed the 4,000 on the western, I'll get this straight, on the eastern shore. If I say it backwards, you just figure it out, okay? <laughs> over there. <laughs> Up above Bethsaida and Chorazin, Bethsaida is a fishing town right on the point of the Sea of Galilee, right there where the Jordan River feeds the Sea of Galilee is where Bethsaida is. Peter is from, from there. Andrew's from there. They, this has been a place that Jesus has spent a lot of time, and Jesus curses Beth, Bethsaida and Chorazin because they had seen all kinds of miracles, and yet we're still rejecting him. He's just healed a blind man and he's left the city and he's gone north to a place called Caesarea Philippi. And it's a place where there's these temples, several of them along a hillside where Pan is worshipped. And there's a variety of gods that have their temples. And they're, they're, there's like four or five temples in a space almost from here to that wall. Small shrines and all, plus a cave down here where they throw body, people down into and see whether they bleed or not. And if they, if they bleed, then good, they were accepted. If they don't see the blood, oh well, that wasn't a good enough sacrifice. Either way, the person's dead. <laughs> but that didn't matter. So, so all, all this worship is taking place at all these different shrines in, hewn into the rock, incidentally. And that's at Caesarea Philippi. Nasty place. A demonic place. And the disciples have been walking by that, and Jesus has said, who do people say that I am? Now he's going to take Peter, James, and John, and he's going to take them up the mountain, Mount, Mount Hermon, approximately 10,000 10, feet. I think it's uh, 9,800 or something like that. It's got snow on it most of the year. Is up here at the northern part, uh, up from Caesarea Philippi. And Jesus takes these three disciples and he says, come on guys, we're going up the mountain. With, he says, where they were all alone. They're going to go up there and Jesus is going to pray. It's going to take them most of the day to, to hike up this mountain. There, listen to this, there he was transfigured before them. <laughs> Several theologians say, couldn't Mark have told us more? There he was transfigured. Okay, whoopee. No, no, this is power. This is amazing. This is huge. There, right in front of their eyes, he metamorphosed. It's the word for metamorphosis. It's the word for the changing of a caterpillar to a butterfly. It's an incredible kind of switch that takes place. And God, Jesus, right before their eyes, starts to glow from the inside out. The glory of God, the Shekinah of God, starts to shine from Jesus in ways that these guys have never seen it before. He's transfigured. He's changed right in front of their eyes and, and, and it startles them. And, and well, let's go on with the text. His clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. <laughs> well, at least Mark's talking about cleaning, I guess, here, right? <laughs> talking about bleaching clothes. Interesting. It's, he's, so, he's so struggling trying to explain. This is such an incredible thing that it's, it's so bright. You can't even bleach your clothes this white. They were so bright. And there appeared before them Elijah and Moses who were talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Here goes the foot. <coughs> Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say. They were so frightened. Then a cloud appeared and enveloped them. And a voice came from the cloud. This is my son, whom I love, Listen to him. And suddenly when they s looked around, they no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus. And there he was, transfigured 
before them. His body transformed right in front of their eyes. Can you imagine this? What, what they started to see was some of what Moses saw when he was up on the mountain. And, and God says, okay, I'm going to walk by you, but, but I can't show you everything. I can't show you my face or I would destroy you. So he hides him in a rock, puts him behind, and he says, now when I get past you, you look at me from behind. And he says he sees the Shekinah, the glory of God. It's what Moses experienced every time he would meet with God, either on the mountain or in the tent of meeting. And he would come out, his face glowing. In fact, Moses was so glow that they put a veil over Moses' face because the glory of God was shining from Moses. Of course, Moses did a mistake. He kept wearing the veil after the glow left because he didn't want everyone to know that he'd lost the glow. But it was that kind of glow, it was that kind of experience that, that they were experiencing. Their clothes were, da it, Jesus' clothes was dazzling, whiter than anything that a belief could do. And all the Gospels talk about this transfiguration. Did you know that? Matthew, Mark, Luke, every single one of them. And even John does. Now, you will not find him say that they were transfigured. You will not find him say that they went up onto a mountain and prayed. But what will you find? Well, John 1, 14. We beheld, what? His glory. The glory of the one and only. John saying, yes. Why, I was there. <laughs> And we saw the glory of the Lord shining from him. In other places in the Old Testament, Exodus 24, God appears to Moses as light. In Exodus chapter 40, there's 34 and 35. The tabernacle is completed. They're dedicating it. And what happens? The glory of God, the light of God shines on the tabernacle. At Kadesh Barnea, you remember in Numbers chapter 14 where the children of Israel rebelled against God? Again, God appears as light. A couple cha chapters later, in the 16th chapter of Numbers, in the exposure of the sins of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram, God again appears as light. Number 16, the same chapter, the rebellion of Israel against Moses and Aaron. They're going to try to be betray these leaders, and, and, and God appears as light. And Meribah, where they're complaining about the water. Israel is thirsty, and, and the temp and God appears as light. When the temple was completed, what happens? The glory of the Lord comes down upon the temple of God, and God appears as light. Or <coughs> he appears as blazing glory in 2 Chronicles 7, when the first offering, the first sacrifice was made in the temple. We beheld his glory, the glory of the one and only God himself. Peter says it this way in 2 Peter, for we did not follow cleverly devised stories when we told you about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in power, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. He received honor and glory from God the Father when the voice came to him from the majestic glory saying, this is my son whom I love and with him I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice that came from heaven when we were with him on the sacred mountain. We saw Jesus transfigured and it changed us. Incidentally, this word transfigured, it's a word that relates to us as well. Romans <laughs> chapter 12. Verse 2, what does Paul say? Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but what? Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. It's what Paul was also describing in Colossians 3. Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your heart on things above. Be transformed. Where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. God wants to transform us like he did with Jesus Christ. But let's back up for a second. I disagree with a lot of the theologians. And you say, well, who are you, Bill? Well, let me explain. <laughs> a number of theologians make the emphasis of this text that this is all about the disciples. The disciples needed to see the glory of the Lord. If that was the case, why didn't Jesus take all 12 of them up there? 
Jesus takes three men up. They're the closest friends that he has in the team of disciples because he needs to have three witnesses. Yes, three witnesses to what he's experiencing. Three people to be there alongside of him. Three people to support him. Peter, James, and John, the men that are closest to him, the men that know him best. But it's not for them that they're going up the mountain. What has Jesus just said? I am going to Jerusalem to be rejected and to die. He gets up on this mountain. And why would he need to pray now? Go on to Jerusalem. We're going to go take on the world, right? Oh, no. The burden of the cross will become very heavy. Because now, he is headed straight to Jerusalem. Yes, I understand it'll take him six months to get there. Well, at least a process of experiences that will take him to get to the cross. But everything that he's doing from here on out is about getting to the cross to give up his life, to sacrifice himself for us. And the pain and the weight of that, the weight of sin is already coming heavy upon his shoulders. The reason why the transfiguration took place was that Father God wants to prepare Jesus, his son, for the mission he's about to complete. Now, why do I say that? The word says that Moses, the giver of the law, and Elijah, the greatest prophet, the prophet who performed the greatest miracles, that these two visit with Jesus. Who is Jesus? The son of God, the servant. Luke gives us a little more insight in why this all happens. He says that, that Elijah and Moses, and can you imagine this, this scene here? The light is so bright because the glory of the Lord is shining because God, Jesus, is God. And the glory of the Lord is visible for these disciples to even see, and they're like, oh, wow, this is incredible. And then they recognize Moses and Elijah, I don't know how, they must have had name tags or something, but to, to, <laughs> Moses and Elijah, it's, it's to do them. Or they must, maybe they watched Ben-Hur, right? The, the, the Ten Commandments. Somehow they knew that these two guys were Moses and Elijah, they understood. Maybe he had the stone captives in his hands there. I doubt that. But they simply understood by God's revelation. Maybe it was because they're listening for a change and, and they hear Jesus saying, Moses and Elijah. And, but they knew. And then Moses and Elijah are standing there and they're talking with Jesus. Whoa. And here's the little insight Luke gives us. In Luke 9, 31. They spoke about his departure, which he was about to bring to fulfillment at Jerusalem. What departure? <laughs> Gee, that sounds like Star Trek, doesn't it? They spoke about his, you know, whoo, he's going to go going up, right? Now, in fact, the word that's used there is his exodus. They spoke about his exodus. Oh, well, that sounds nice. Yeah, he's going he's gonna to get to, you know, get shuttled up somehow. And all. Oh, no, this was the exodus which meant his death. They spoke with him about the cross. They spoke with him about his sacrifice. They were speaking with him about the agony that he was about to go through. Jesus is being blessed by three witnesses. Moses. What did Jesus do? He says, I came not to throw away the law, but to fulfill the law. Elijah, the greatest prophet that had ever lived. A prophet who was simply taken up into heaven in Jesus is also now a great prophet, isn't he? The living, the spoken word of God present with us, Jesus. And, and now Moses, Elijah, and, and remember, we have to have three witnesses. Who's the third witness that's going to encourage Jesus? Who's that third one that's going to say, you are the Messiah? Who's the one that's going to say, you are God? It's God, Father God himself. This is my son. This is my beloved son. This is the son I love. Listen to him. The Mount of Transfiguration. Oh, yeah, it encourages us all. And, and it got Peter going, didn't it? It got him all excited. But the fact is, is that the purpose of the Mount of Transfiguration, that moment, was to prepare Jesus for his death. <coughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
And then we have Peter. Jesus! Let's build three tabernacles right here. One for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. This is going to be a really wonderful thing. I don't know what I'm saying, but i got to say something because I'm really upset. I'm really nervous about what's happening right here. Jesus, let's do this quickly, please, okay? And then can you see a cloud? I think God understands the dramatic. <laughs> the, the cloud, it says, comes in. Comes over them all. And then the voice. This is my son whom I love. Now if you're Jesus, are you thinking about what Peter's saying? <laughs> are you listening? Are you listening to dad say, son? I know you're going to hell. Son, I know that you're heading down a road that is literally going to take you into hell. I know that you're going to feel things we've never felt. I know that you're going to experience stuff you've never experienced. I know that this is going to be terrible. Son, I love you. And as you walk to Jerusalem, and you carry that cross up that mountain, as they spit at you and jeer at you and they throw stones at you, as they haul or curses at you and claim you're not God, as they treat you as a rebel, as they treat you as a blasphemer, as they accuse you of the very things that you truly are, as if you're not, I love you. So what do you think that Jesus was thinking about as he's going there? What, did, what carried him through when that whip was wrapping around his flesh and tearing muscle parts out of his body? What, what caused him to hang on? What took him up on that cross as they're putting those spikes in his body? What, what kept him strong in the middle of all that? Son, I love you. This is my son. My beloved son. And he hears his father speaking to him. And then he says to us, listen to him. This is the son of the great I am. I love my son. He's about to die for you. Listen to him. John 5, very truly I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be judged but has crossed over from death to life. Listen to him. John 8, 47, whoever belongs to God hears what God says. The reason you do not hear is that you do not belong to God. Are you listening to him? John 10, 27, my sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. And anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. Listen to him. Peter had no idea what he was saying, did he? Why? Why? Well, he remembered the tabernacles he had just seen down at Caesarea Philippi. Okay, well, let's do that. He also was probably thinking about the fact that at that very week, while they're there on the mountain, the Feast of Tabernacles is taking place in Jerusalem. Oh yeah, this is the week we're supposed to be in Jerusalem already. We're supposed to be building little tabernacles and staying outside at them and celebrating the, the fact that God blesses his people. He says, and so let's build these tabernacles. The bottom line was Peter the word says, was scared. Wouldn't you be afraid if you were in the presence of the Shekinah, the glory of God? And God himself will come and speak out loud. If you weren't afraid in that moment, something's wrong. Because you're not realizing that you're in the presence of God. And that Jesus is way more than what you thought he was. Yes, you've called him Messiah, but he's God. 
And you're starting to catch a glimpse of that. And it's so startling you that the only thing you can do is put your foot in your mouth and that's what Peter does. Incidentally, they come down the mountain. As they're coming down the mountain, verse 9, Jesus gave them orders not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. He says, okay, guys, go walking down the mountain. And I, I got a feeling they're kind of all like, I mean, I'm thinking they're probably saying nothing. Did you? They're not even. Did you see? Uh, no, no. It's just, they're walking down the mountain. This is, what a moment. Did we really see what we just saw? Oh, wow. And Jesus says, now, I don't want you to talk about this. Jesus, I don't know how we'd talk about it if we did. I don't want you to talk about this to anyone. <clears throat> don't tell anyone what you've seen. until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. This is the second time within a couple of days Jesus is telling disciples that he's going to rise from the dead, but they don't hear it, or they at least don't understand it. <clears throat> they kept the matter to themselves, and now they start talking. What does rising from the dead mean? See, they didn't get it, did they? <laughs> Peter, John, what does rising from the dead mean? What's, what in the world is he talking about? And so they ask him, they don't ask him what's rising from the dead, they ask him a side question. Why do the teachers of the law say that Elijah must come first? Why, why must Elijah come first before the Messiah? And, and, and Jesus replied, to be sure, Elijah does come first and he restores all things. Why then is it written that the Son of Man must suffer much and be rejected? But I tell you, Elijah has come. And they have done to him everything they wished, just as it is written about him. What's he talking about? How did Elijah come? In John the Baptist. Matthew 17. The disciples asked him, why then do the teachers of the law say that Elijah must come first? Jesus replied, to be sure Elijah comes and will restore all things. But I tell you, Elijah has already come and they did not recognize him, but have done to him everything they wished. In the same way, the Son of Man is going to suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he was talking to them about John the Baptist. Elijah has come. The prophet has prepared the way. The prophet has called people to repentance. Elijah himself, and he has been rejected. He's been beheaded. He's been killed. They didn't want him around. And in the same way, the Son of Man is going to suffer and die. Are you listening? This is my beloved son I'm pleased with him listen to him Mark in the fourth chapter tell, Jesus tells a story about listening it's the story that we refer to as the parable of the soils in verse 3 he says listen a farmer went out to sow his seed. Verse 9, then Jesus said, whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. Verse 12, so that they may be ever seeing but never perceiving and ever hearing but never understanding, otherwise they might turn and be forgiven. Verse 15, some people are like seed along the path where the word is sown. As soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown in them. Others, like seed sown on rocky places, hear the word and at once receive it. Hear the word, excuse me, with joy. Still others, like seed sown among thorns, hear the word, but is choked up. In verse 20, others, like seed sown on good soil, hear the word, accept it, and produce a crop, some 30, some 60, some 100 times, and what was sown. And then Jesus goes on, if anyone has ears to hear, let them hear. Consider carefully what you hear. 
he continued, with the measure you use, it will be measured to you and even more. The word here and listen is used something like 10 or 12 times in that little section of parable. Listening matters to Jesus. Are you listening to Jesus? Listeners produce more listeners. Have you ever noticed how hard it is to listen when you're talking? <laughs> listeners come to understanding. So Jesus said, look, when the, the word of God gets planted inside there, when you've really listened to it, you're going to understand the things of God. Listeners take what they hear and use it in their life. Listeners experience the power of God because they've heard God speak and listened to him. Are you a listener? And are you listening to God today? If you look back, you may find a time where you listened really well. You were close to God. You were doing his will. But are you a listener today? Or maybe you've never listened. Maybe you never quite got it, never quite understood. But Jesus is saying, look, if you'll listen to me, I'll be there with you. If you'll listen to me, I'll lead you through your life. If you'll listen to me, I'll meet your needs. If you'll listen to me, I'll forgive you and I'll help you to forgive those who have hurt you. Listen. We are so vulnerable to listening to ourselves and to the world around us instead of listening to God. Are you listening? What a command. This is my son, my beloved son. <coughs> Listen to him. So let's pray. Don't talk to him. Listen to him. What is God trying to say to you right now? Listen to him. But it's so noisy. There's so much going on in my life. It's so hard to hear. Stop and listen to him. This is the Son of God, the beloved Son of God, who loves you.